Okay, sit in that chair. All right, here's the deal. Marshmallow, for you. You can either wait, and I'll give you another one if you wait, or you can eat it now. When I come back, I'll give you two, another one, so then you'll have two. But stay in here and stay in the chair till I come back, okay? okay. All right. All right, so I'm gonna leave and then I'll come back, okay? So you can either eat it right now or you can wait. Either way, okay? Okay. How'd you do? Did you do good? You did? Yeah. You wanted to eat it, didn't you? Yeah. So did I tell you I'd give you another one? Okay, now you can have both. You need them. <laughs> so good. I love that. Oh, temptation is so hard, isn't it? It's so hard to resist the thing I want now for the thing that I want most, right? And you look at those little kids. I love the little guy that, like, he, he kisses the marshmallow, you know? Or the little girl that can't even wait for the instructions to be given. That little redheaded girl, you know, the lady puts it down and is like, okay, here's how it's going to work. She's like, oh. <laughs> you can go now. I have my marshmallow. I'm good. Oh. And, and you can't help the kids are so cute. You're just rooting for them. You want them to learn the lesson that what you want now is rarely what you want most. That's why temptation is so hard. Temptation, really, it, it doesn't make any sense because often we will grab what we want now instead of what we want most because it's the thing right in front of us. The truth is, I watch those little kids and I go, oh, it's so cute. I hope you learn the lesson. And then it doesn't take long for me to think about myself in areas of my own life where the truth is I'll grab the thing now that I want now rather than wait for the thing that I want most. Temptation is such a universal experience, even though it really doesn't make sense all that much. I, I mean, it really doesn't. Um, uh, let me ask you, how many of you believe in lying? You just think, oh man, I think we all ought to lie. That yeah, no hand in this room. How about at the other campuses? Yeah, and you know, I, I don't want my parents to lie to me. I, I'll teach my kids not to lie. I don't want my government to lie to me. I don't want my employees to lie to me. I don't want my employer to lie to me. Like, I don't want my spouse to lie to me. I do not believe in lying. And yet, in certain circumstances, oh, you lie? Right? When it protects me or it helps me get out of a speedy ticket or whatever it is, you know, when, when that moment comes, it's so hard to resist that temptation. Now, I, I don't know anybody in this place that would say, you know what a goal of mine is, is I, I, I just, I, I, I want to see unfaithfulness among spouses. Nobody wants to see that. Uh, no, nobody enters into marriage. Nobody walks down the aisle thinking, that's my goal. I want to see this thing fall apart. And nobody would, would want that for our kids. I, I don't want my kids to marry somebody that, that that's going to happen. I, I don't want that to happen with my parents. And yet for so many of us in this place, even though the, we just, we don't want that at all, for so many of us in this place, that is a part of our past or even a part of our present. Listen, if you are somebody that struggles with addiction, goodness, you could write a book on this. Because the truth is, you hate your addiction. You hate what it does to you. You hate what it does to your self-esteem. You hate what it does to your, your, your reputation. You hate what it does to your finances. You hate the way it's affecting your relationships. You hate that addiction. And yet, this week, you're 
would just go right back to it. Oh, it is, temptation is a big deal. And, and here's the thing, I, I just want you to know, like, we, you're in good company because we all experience it. And even in the Bible, uh, Paul is an early church leader. Paul is, um, oh, just, he, he, he came to know Jesus through a miraculous experience. He ends up writing over half the New Testament. He plants churches all over Asia Minor. He, he's this incredible guy. And yet look what he says in Romans 7.15. He says, you know what? I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do it. And we know what that feels like, don't we? Well, sure, we do. And sure, Paul does. Let me ask you the question. Does Jesus know what that feels like? Did Jesus experience temptation? I mean, really? I mean, he was God, right? Didn't he just sort of float around and as temptations would go past him, he would just be like, oh, you know, oh, like, did he really feel a tug inside to do the wrong Thing. If you have your Bibles, uh, turn with me to the book of Luke, chapter 4. We're going to start in verse 1, and I want to show you what is commonly referred to the story of the temptations of Jesus. Uh, it starts out this way. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan. So Matthew tells us, and Matthew reports on this story as well, and he tells us that this is right after Jesus has been baptized. This is right after the heavens have opened up and God has said, this is my son whom I love and whom I am well pleased. And this is the beginning of Jesus' ministry. And Matthew tells us this, it's a spiritual high. And now he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. How many of you know that temptation is relentless? I, I don't know how long or how many years I, I've looked at this story, and I always thought it was like Jesus was out there 40 days, and then right at the end he gets these three temptations from Satan. He passes the test, and he moves on. That's not what it says. I don't know if Satan came at him every day with the same three. I don't know if there were thousands of different kinds of temptations over the course of those 40 days. But what it says is that he went out for 40 days. He was tempted by the devil. And he ate nothing during those days. In other words, he's going to uh, implement fasting prayer, the most intense sort of prayer that he could muster to be connected with God, to endure and to resist them to this temptation. So he ate nothing during those days for 40 days, and at the end of them, he was hungry. And all God's people said, duh. Right? <laughs> like, I don't want to critique Luke. It's not like any of my writings have made it into the Bible, okay? But I just want to go up to Luke at some point and go, you really felt the need to include that detail, you know? After 40 days of not eating, he was hungry. All right. The devil said to him, if you are the son of God, tell this stone to become bread. Now, that, that seems kind of crazy, except for the fact that Jesus had the power to do that. Jesus could have easily just made that happen. We know later on he turns water into wine. We know later on that he multiplies bread to, to feed over 5,000 people. Like Jesus had the ability to do that in an instant. And here he is 40 days hungry. Listen to what Jesus said. Jesus answered, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone. Now it's in quotes there because Jesus is actually quoting Deuteronomy 8 Three, where God gave his people manna in the wilderness, this miraculous bread that God gave the people, and he gave them just enough to sustain them daily. And the reason he did is in this verse, because it says this, that he, gave, he fed, fed you to teach you that man does not live by bread alone but by every word that comes from the Father's mouth. God was teaching them that, yes, bread sustains your body, but even more than bread, what you need to sustain you is your relationship, your daily dependence on God. And Jesus is basically looking at Satan going, here's the thing, I'm not getting through all these temptations 
because, uh, because of bread. I'm getting through these because I've got this connection with God, and I don't want to do anything that's going to mess that up. I've been fasting, and I don't want to lessen my dependence on God. So no, I'm not going to turn these stones into bread. The devil goes on, verse 5. The devil led him up to a high place. And showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. Now, how did that happen? I don't know. Maybe it was sort of a miraculous movie show. (laughs) But probably what happened was he put him in a place where panoramically the Romans had had created by this time this incredible um, roads system. And probably what happened is Satan is showing Jesus, here's the road to, to Rome, and here's the road to Greece, and here's the, Rome to As- or the road to Assyria, here's the road to Persia, all the important, powerful kingdoms of the world. And, and you can just sort of see them out in front of you. And he says this, I will give you all their authority and splendor. It's been given to me, and I can give it to anyone I want to. If you worship me, it will all be yours. And I've always read that as sort of like, if you will bow down and start following me every day, if you would would worship me, if you would be like not in God's team, not on God's path anymore, but be with me all the time, then I'll give you all this stuff. But do you know what? In the Greek, it actually says, it actually indicates that he's saying, bow down to me once. One time. Just just one time, Jesus, just one time, bow down to me. And Jesus knows, though, that if I bow down one time, I'm disqualified. I can't be that spotless lamb. I can't be that perfect sacrifice for sins anymore. And so I can't bow down to you unless I want to give up the entire rescue mission that I was sent down here to perform. So no, I cannot bow down to you one time. Jesus answered in verse 8, it is written... Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. That's Deuteronomy 6.13, by the way, that Jesus is quoting. In verse 9, the devil led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down from here, for it is written. Now, I love this, (laughs) because Satan's basically going, okay, you're going to use the book? Guess what? I'm going to use the book. And what Satan does here is he actually quotes the Bible back to Jesus. He he does. He quotes Psalm 91. He says, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. And you know what? Satan is absolutely right. That is in the Bible. And it's referring to Jesus. But it is referring to Jesus in, in, in the manner of if he were to slip, if he were to fall, if he were to, you know, stumble into something, oh, God would take care. It is not referring to Jesus testing God. It is not referring to Jesus throwing himself off. And oh, by the way, Satan left out the part of the scripture that talks about the Messiah crushing the head of the serpent. <laughs> well, Jesus answered, it is said... Do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished all his tempting, he left him until an opportune time. And so Satan tempts Jesus three different ways, and each time Jesus answers with something. Did you hear what it was? It was Scripture. Three different times in three different ways, three different motivations, three different scenarios. And every time Jesus comes back with Scripture. That's why we're calling this series Read All About It. Yes, it's talking about the good news, the good news, the gospel of Jesus. But we also know how important it is for you to read it. And our action step in this series is for you to read Scripture. You know, we kind of have an action step for every message. We kind of have an action step for every series. So we did a a series on stewardship and generosity, and the action step was stewardship and generosity. We did um, uh, a couple of messages, amen and amen. We looked at communion, and then we experienced it. We took action together and experienced communion together. And then we as a church, we talked about baptism last week, and then we had baptisms this week, uh, uh, last week. And we said last week that we're going to start doing baptisms on a more regular basis. 
In fact, here at South Barrington, I don't know, uh, I didn't look at the schedule at the other campuses, but here at South Barrington, we got 25 people over the next three weeks that are going to get baptized. How cool is that? Yes. And we cheer them on. And I'll tell you, this is another one. I just have to share this with you because it's, it's just so great. Last weekend, could just throw up the picture real quick. I think we have this picture. Last weekend, that's Ala. I think that's how you pronounce her name. That's at our North Shore campus. Ala is Ukrainian. Her husband is Russian. And Ala is going down in the baptistry, and she pauses for a second, and she says, I, I, I don't know if I can do this because um, this is a celebration, and I just, I don't know that I feel like celebrating right now with all that's going on in the world. And then she pauses, and she goes, no. This is exactly what I need to be doing right now. I should be celebrating the fact, right, that in the kingdom of God there is unity. Like we have a Ukrainian and a Russian who are married. <laughs> this is a place where, where peace comes into the world. The, the, the kingdom is the place where, 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 where fighting gets mended together. And I think we ought to celebrate that real quick as well. And also just a note to those of Eastern European descent, or if you, have, um, if you have family or friends or connections and you're a part of this church or watching this online, you just need to know that we are daily lifting you up in prayer. We are daily praying for peace and for God to move in that situation. Yeah. Okay. So the, that, the, the, the action step from last week was baptism. The action step for this week and this series is really to get you into the Word of God. We really want you to read all about it. So there are 24 chapters in the book of Luke, and there's about 28 days from now until Easter. That is the length of our series. And I just want to encourage you uh, to pick up the book of Luke and read a chapter a day. And you've got four skips. How cool is that, right? But just read a chapter a day, and then next week we're actually going to add some, some prayer emphasis to it as well, and you can sign up for, for, for that as well, and you'll get more information on it. But I just really want to encourage you, because you, know, you all did the study a few years ago, the reveal study, that said the number one indicator or the number one catalyst for spiritual growth above anything else is Bible engagement. Bible engagement. And I just really believe that if we could get the, I think last time I checked, there were about 50,000 people on our mail, mailing list. If we could get everybody that, that calls Willow home or that's connected to Willow to open up the Bible every day, read a passage of Scripture, and then prayerfully say, God, what do you want me to do about this? And then do it. Revival. Like right then and there. Revival. So I just want to encourage you to read along with us this book of the Bible. Okay, now we've read our story. Can I make some observations about this when it comes to uh, temptation? All right, first one is this, when temptation comes. Let's look at when temptation comes. Number one, after a spiritual high. I told you that Jesus had just been baptized. He'd been uh, just moving into his ministry. He's starting his ministry, and that's when Satan perks up and attacks. Now, this is um, uh, representing a temptation that many of us have, food, right? Uh, food. And for you, it might not be a donut. It might be a cheeseburger. It might be pizza. It might be ice cream. I don't know what it is. For me, um, we're going to hypothetically go with the donut, because we didn't have a salad back there. So we're going to go with the donut. And here's what's interesting about the donut. Here's what's interesting. Is, do you know, I've noticed recently, I'm doing a little weight loss challenge with a friend of mine. You know what I'm noticing is that the day that I get off the scale and I look down at the scale and I go, ooh, I'm doing pretty good. I'll walk off that scale, and for whatever reason, that's the time that I get really tempted. Or it's when I call my friend and I say, hey, you know what, let's work together, let's lose weight together, let's make this happen. And now I find myself, I am noticing every donut shop on the way from home to church. 
And I don't know what it is. Well, here's the thing. Temptation comes after a spiritual high. That's what happens with Jesus, and that's what often happens with us as well. We get the promotion, or we get um, a great thing happens in our life, and maybe our guard goes down a little bit. We're not as vigilant as we were before. And especially with a spiritual high, I think what happens is when people say, hey, you know what, I'm going to step up and get to a small group, or I'm going to step up and go on a mission trip, or I'm going to trust God with my finances, or I'm going to, uh, I'm going to get involved and serve on a team, or I'm going to, I'm going to, you know what I'm going to try to do? I'm going to actually try and read the book of Luke over the next few weeks. And what I think begins to happen is Satan goes, here's the thing. They were kind of on the sideline. They weren't much of a threat to me anymore or back then. But now they're stepping it up, this sort of spiritual high, this spiritual momentum. And I think Satan comes and says, well, we need to do something about that. I don't want them to experience that life. I don't want them to experience that momentum. It often comes, just like in this story, after a spiritual high. Do you know when else temptation will often come? It's when we are alone. Chapter 4, verse 1, Jesus was alone. Guess what? I'm not really actually tempted to eat this donut right now. Do you know why? Because you're all here. <laughs> and, 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 and this, I've got cameras on me. This is being recorded right now. My wife would see it. And so I'm not tempted at all, but I fear that if we turn the lights out and you all left and the cameras went off, by the, first, by the time the door closed on your way out, I'd be licking the icing off my fingers. Right? There's something about being alone. There's something about being alone. That's when temptation comes. Some of you are alone when you travel for work. Some of you are alone emotionally because you don't have friends around you that you can confide in. Some of you are alone because you have a secret that no one else has, has ever been a part of, and so you're just alone in that. You may have hundreds of people around you every day, and yet in some way you're completely alone in your life. What we need is people around us that can give us support, people around us that can pray for us, people around us that can give us that healthy accountability where we can really get real with each other, right? Do you agree with me on that? Absolutely. So I am so glad you agree. I want you to turn to your neighbor right now and just share with them your greatest temptation. Would you just, no, I'm just kidding. I'm just <laughs> joking about that because that wouldn't be an appropriate place or time or relationship to do it but you know what would be a counselor a, a small group a, a pastor that you could you could become unalone with we encourage you to do that find some place where you can not be alone anymore the temptation will come when we're alone will come after spiritual high here's the other one when you're in the wrong place when you're in the wrong place, you know, Jesus was led out to the desert. The Greek word eremos, uh, the, the Bible basically is the, it's the desert, it's the wilderness, it's the place that the Israelites were sort of punished to have to go and wander for 40 years. Like it is not the place, it's the place of chaos, it's the place of, of evil, it's, it, it's the place that, that, that is the wrong place. <laughs> Here's the thing. My morning beverage in the morning, right? I don't know if you get pop, you get coffee, whatever, whatever you get. I cannot get my morning beverage at Dunkin' Donuts. Do you know why? Because I would be running up to, I'd be going up to the drive-thru, making the turn into the, the parking lot, going up to the drive-thru and thinking to myself, just get a Diet Coke. Just get a Diet Coke, just get a cup of coffee. Just get a Diet Coke, just get a cup of coffee. And then by the time I was through that line, I would be Dunkin' Donuts, okay? I would be Dunkin' the Donut. I can't go to that place. I've got to go somewhere else. You know, it's the alcoholic who says yes to the bachelor party. Ooh, maybe not the wise place to be. It's the senior who picks the party school Maybe that's not the best choice. It's a salesman who says, you know, I know I've heard that they've got a toxic culture in that company, but they can, you can make a lot of money there, and you know what? I just won't participate. Ooh, I don't know. Be real 
real careful. You know, one of my heroes in ministry is Bob Russell. He led a large church in Louisville, Kentucky, and he tells this story. Um, he was a pastor back when pastors wore suits every, every Sunday. And can we just never bring that back, okay? <laughs> Here's the deal. I've got my best jeans on for you today, okay? Um, but he was a pastor back then, so he had dry cleaning every week. So he was taking his suit to the dry cleaners, his dry cleaning to the dry cleaners, and he noticed that this restaurant had a dumpster out in front of it that, you know, it was closed down and somebody was renovating. He said, oh, what's going on over there? And the clerk that took his clothes said, oh, you know what? They're putting in a strip club over there. And of course, you know, Bob Russell, he's a pastor. He's like, oh my, oh my, oh my. You know, he dropped his clothes off and, and he, he went home. He, he came back a week later to, to switch his, his clothes. And they had a sign up at that place now. And the sign had this sort of sultry woman on it, you know, doing the, you know, or whatever. I, I don't know. I didn't see it. But some sort of sign like that. And Bob would say, you know what? I, I, you just, you, you, you can't help but notice that sign. And he switched his dry cleaning and he went home. Well, a week later he came back and he noticed that that place was open. There were people going in and out. And the, when the doors would open, the music would come out. And, and you just can't help imagine what's going on in there. So as these stories go, Bob Russell switched dry cleaners. Do you get the point? Don't be in the wrong place. And you do whatever you need to do to make sure that you don't get caught up in a place where temptation is going to come at you again and again and again relentlessly. Okay, that's when temptation comes. Let's talk about where temptation comes from. Where does temptation come from? Uh, Jesus was hungry. Uh, temptation comes from the human condition. It just comes from the fact that you are exactly human-sized, and you deal with all the human stuff. You have appetites. You have weaknesses. Our 12-step recovery programs, our, our friends there, and by goodness, I just want to say thank you because this group of people, they teach us so much. We're so valuable. It's so valuable to have you all. One of the things that, that, that they talk about is HALT. It's an acronym, HALT. When you are hungry, angry, lonely or tired halt because when you are one of those things you are very susceptible to the temptation does that make sense to you of course it does when i'm hungry when i'm angry when i'm lonely or when i'm tired i'm susceptible to those things now what we need to do is understand that we're just human beings we're just human the appetite is not bad it's what we need to do to satisfy that appetite. Let me tell you what I'm talking about. If you get angry, guess what? That's not a sin. Even the Bible says it. It's not, it's not an angry to be a sin. Jesus got it. God gets angry. It's not, it's not a sin to be angry. It's what you do with that. And what you need to do is satisfy that anger, that, that appetite for release, that stress release. You need to satisfy that in the right way. Do you know there's a study in 2012 that showed that when people go online and they rant and they vent, how many of you go, you know what, I just need to vent. I just need to get it out. Guess what? It doesn't work. There's a study in 2012 that says people that go online and vent have more negative emotions when they're done. It doesn't work. When you vent, it just stirs it up more. You've got to come up with a better, more constructive, more, more appropriate, more healthy way to express your anger. It's not that anger, that appetite is wrong. Um, intimacy, uh, sexual in intimacy, that is not a wrong appetite. That's a gift from God. But if you do not satisfy that in a healthy, God-honoring way, then it can lead to destruction. I always talk about it like it's a fire in the fireplace. Like sexual intimacy is supposed to be in the context of marriage. It's a fire in the fireplace. If it's in the fireplace, it warms the house. It's a wonderful thing. But if it goes outside the marriage, goes outside the fireplace, it'll burn down the house. Does that make sense? That's another whole message, but we got to move on. Be careful how you take that human condition and satisfy it, right? Okay, next thing, uh, it will also come from Satan. Yeah, I mean, that's what our story is about, that we actually have an enemy. John 10.10 10 says, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they might have life and have it to the full. 
That means that when t- temptation comes, it comes from uh, a human condition, it comes from circumstance, but you also have this enemy who's out there trying to get you, who's trying to steal from you, steal joy, steal peace from you, who's trying to destroy relationships in your life. He's rooting against you. He's working against you. And if you realize that, if you recognize that, I don't know about you, but I'm competitive. And there's something about that that just makes me want to sort of get, no, you're not going to beat me. You will not defeat me, Satan. <laughs> um, my friend, Mike Bro was a teaching pastor here um, years ago. And he has a, a letter to Satan that he shares in some of his messages. Let me read this letter to you. It says, Satan, take note and listen well. You will not conquer me. I'm blood washed, spirit filled, daily delivered, strongly sanctified, spirit soaked, and word indwelt. (laughs) I'm linked with sovereign and eternal power and have set my face. You're extremely subtle, but I'm on to your ways. You parade as an angel of light, but I walk in much brighter light. Your days of deception are over with me. I won't be deceived, detoured. Derailed, distorted, distracted, discouraged, or disillusioned by your schemes. Your vile influence will not cross the no trespassing sign on the gate of my heart. My life is off limits to you now. My doors are closed to you forever. You won't walk in, crawl in, slither in, sneak in, pry in, jump in, swim in, fly in, drive in, or barge into my life. I now have a permanent guest that lives inside. And he will will never share my temple with you. Face it, your days are numbered, your kingdom is doomed, your designs are dwindling, your evil eroding, your devilishness dissolving, your deceit decaying, your deception diminishing, and your death is dead. Your victory party has been canceled, and soon your show will be over. You can't trap me with your snares, soil me with your subtlety, or defeat me with your deception, because he that is in me is greater than you, so get off my property. Isn't that good? (laughs) Well, in our story, temptation comes from the human condition. It came from Satan. But do you know where else temptation comes from? God. Indirectly. Did you notice who led Jesus out into the the wilderness to be tempted in the first place? It was the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit. Does that... Does that seem odd to you? Has it ever seemed odd to you that prayer that Jesus taught us to pray? Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Now, you'll notice that the Spirit is not doing the tempting. That would be uh, counter to God's nature. God would never tempt someone, but He can lead them to a place where He knows they will be tempted. And why would He do that? Well, it's the same reason that I teach my kids to drive. I know that I'm putting them in harm's way. I know that they are more safe at home. I know that they can be exposed to more things when they're driving. But there's a greater good. Namely, I don't have to take them to all their activities. (laughs) It's the same reason you send your kids to college. You know that when they go to college, they could be exposed to this or that or whatever. But you know that there's a greater good. And you believe in your kids. And here is God leading Jesus to the wilderness. Why? Because he believes in Jesus. He he believes that Jesus is going to be able to resist that temptation and have victory in uh, in this circumstance. And he knows that there's a greater good that he sent him out there to realize. We started the message asking, was Jesus ever tempted. I mean, really? I love what Hebrews says about Jesus. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. 
Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. And normally, when I end a message, I draw people's attention to the fact that Jesus died for them. I would usually at this point talk about how Jesus died for you, and that's absolutely true. But can I add to the fact that Jesus died for you the most amazing thing? That Jesus lived for you. That each and every day, Jesus was absolutely a human being just as much as he was God. That means he got tired, he got angry, he got lonely, he got, he, he got hungry. And every day he had temptations surrounding him. Uh, was Jesus tempted to, 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 to tell his parents to take a hike? Yeah, he was tempted. He was tempted to power up and seek revenge on people that ticked him off. He was tempted to make fun of people. Jesus was tempted to use his power to serve himself. Was he, was he tempted with, with, with women? Yes, he was. He was tempted to choose comfort and riches and power over the cross. But every moment, Jesus made the right decision. Every time that he was tempted, he made the right decision. Every day, every minute, every moment, Jesus lived in such a way that got him to the place that when he died on the cross for you, it made a difference. And that's an amazing thing to think about. That not only did he die for you, but he lived with you in mind. Our Jesus gave up the glory of heaven to come down and to die on the cross for you and for me. And because he was both fully God and fully man, and because he was without sin, his death means that he has the authority to give an invitation to you to say, if you will come and follow me, if you'll put your faith in me and follow me, then your sins can be forgiven and you can live with God forever. Folks, that's the good news. That's the gospel. And that's the invitation that he offers you today. If you've never said yes to Jesus, then maybe today is your first time. We invite you to do that um, at each of your campuses. You can go out to the Next Steps area, come find a pastor after the service. We help you make that decision, answer questions for you, sort of pastor you through that decision. And maybe your next step is just to, to get into a small group, to begin to build some of that accountability. Maybe for you, your next step is to find a counselor and share some of the things that are going on in your life. Maybe for you, your next step is get on a team around here or to trust God in some area of your life. Or maybe for you, your next step is to love your neighbor because that's what Jesus invited us to do. Or maybe for you, your next step is just to come back next week and keep learning more about our Savior, Jesus.